Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here today with Tycoon Michael Kester. I'm Tycoon Michael. And uh, today we're doing, uh, today is our Leaders of Industry show. Yeah. Wait, 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 don't stop listening. There's, there's actually things. Oh, they stopped. So we have two movies on the show today. Yeah, and, we do. Uh-huh. Uh, assuming that people haven't shut off their Zooms already. We can talk about the movies. Yeah. Um, what are those movies? We're going to do The Social Network and wait, The Wait, wait, H- don't stop listening. Oh, sorry. Go on. The Social Network. The Social Network yeah. and The Hudsucker Proxy. Ah, oh, shit. Okay. If you're still listening, thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. We really appreciate also, it. Also, thanks for directing H2. I thought we were going to call that Halloween 2. Sorry. I'm streamlining. It's an industrial day. All right, dear listener. Me and you, Michael Castor. Tycoon Michael, please. And, uh... <laughs> We're going we're gonna to try and do the show on The Social Network and The Hudsucker Proxy today. I realize that the theme of the show is not stabbing people or shooting guns or space rays, but wow, those just really are the three kinds of shows that we do, yeah. isn't it? That's, Tits. That's pretty much Tits it. Tits would round out. Would <laughs> round out. Wow. All right, so there's going to be some spoilers. I'm going to explain to people why our audience should actually see The Social Network, because they're not going to do it, are mm-hmm. they? No. No, I wouldn't not have. Here's the thing, right? We have a lot of stuff uh, planned for this year that actually came out pretty recently. More stuff than we usually do. And people have actually emailed us a lot saying, well, you guys should do more recent stuff. And I still continue to just say, fuck you to those people. We're not going to do it. But in this particular instance, there's some stuff about the social network I want to talk about uh, while it's come out and before everybody just forgets it and dismisses it as boo hiss Oscar Mm -hmm. film, as our audience will rightfully do to most boo hiss Oscar films. Uh, and then the Hudsucker Proxy is a Coen Brothers movie that we're going to talk about. So we're going to spoil both the movies. There's chapters. You can use the uh, the lyrics section to find out the timestamps or whatever and move around that way. Or you can use the chapters embedded in the feed. Yeah. All right. So then first things first, let's just get it out of the way. You are not excited about the social network. No, not at all. I showed this to you for the first time. So before people start thinking you're being really down on the film, mm-hmm. uh, you weren't nearly as unhappy with this film as you thought you would be. No, I. so I have this problem, and 2010 was a really good example for me to be able to talk about it. Let's talk about your problem here on Double Feature. In general, I hate what I call Oscar bait films. Absolutely. And a lot of people have termed Oscar bait films, which are films that when they come out, they usually come out between... Thanksgiving and the end of the year. So you mean December? They come out yeah, in December. Pretty much. All yeah. of them. And they star Philip Seymour Hoffman, Meryl Streep. And we have these slew of films that are always historically based, based on books or plays. Three hours long. Or people's lives. We Three complain hours. about these all the time on the show. They're, they're the and films. we won't stop. We're going to continue to complain <laughs> they about them. They come out and you know they're coming out because they're going to get Academy nominations. They're going to get Golden Globe nominations. And I generally shy away from them because they follow boring film formula. I do not care. I am not interested. And it's 100% recycled. What if I could tell you something exciting? This is going to be a movie by David Fincher about a really popular internet website. Are you excited? Are you excited? No. It's got Eisenberg. Are you excited yet? I don't even know who that is. (laughs) So what happened in 2010 is I ended up seeing all of the Oscar bait films. Mm -hmm. Because, one, there were no real Oscar bait films. We had box office Oscar bait films sure. all of 2010. But So I'm, I'm saying Social Network, Inception, Black Swan, and what's the other one? True Grit. And people are talking about Red as right. well. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. And not but, Lucky McKee Red, other Red. Right, yeah, with uh, the Bruce New Willis Red, guy. right. And, who I should point out, by the way, on the Sin City show, we were talking about all the actors who have disappeared since then. Bruce uh-huh. Willis has not disappeared. He won't. He's not going anywhere. Right. So I'd seen all four of these films yeah. and uh, pretty much par for the course. I walked out of the theater going, eh, right. not so great. And not to say they're all terrible and they're all, the thing is I, I know all the directors. So right. that's why I went social network ended up being the one I liked the most, right? The one I would easily rewatch the one I think easily has the most value as a film. Aside from its, you know, Oscar baiting come all over the golden statue's head. Right. That, so, I mean, that's, uh, that's my, my two cents and why our listenership, if they haven't already chaptered to, uh, what's the, the second movie? Proxy. Yeah. And then, or the end of the film, why you should continue listening. I felt the exact same way about it. And I think the biggest thing is not even to, uh, to talk about 
are these uh, these awards films, are they good or are they worth seeing? Or I mean, when has our show ever been about what's worth seeing? I guess in a lot of ways, that is what our show is about. That's entirely it's not, what our a, it's not about. a seen it, skip it, run it on DVD, that bullshit. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care when I heard what the movie was about. And I didn't care when I heard what the director was or who's in it. But then something piqued my interest. Mm-hmm. And that's something, and this is a glorious Justin day. Timberlake. You could have at least waited until I said something about music that Joe Justin Timberlake. So much more pointed. Is the music. Justin Timberlake. There you go. Uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross do the score of, mm-hmm. of course, Nine Inch Nails. And we'll get to that stuff. Oh, God, will we get to that stuff? Because I'm finally, after 136 fucking shows, qualified to talk about a movie. Right. Not to say you haven't talked about Nine Inch Nails before. No, that's never But this time you actually have a reason to. Right. I think I've also spent 136 shows making Nine Inch Nails jokes that Mm -hmm. no one got. But yeah, we can definitely talk about that now. So that's what led me to the movie. And so this gets back to what I was saying about good or bad or rented or whatever. None of that matters to me because as an awards film, as a film that I expected to just be the kind of Benjamin Button stuff, mm-hmm. I found that it actually had the capacity to surprise me. Yeah. I actually came away from it, oh, I don't know, thinking. I came away from it with things to say, and uh, and I wanted to see it again. And so whether you're going to say a movie like, say, Inception is, eh, it's okay, we're seeing whatever mm-hmm. fucking stupid critic opinion you want to have about right. it. I see the social network and it actually provokes thoughts and emotions and what I expect out of other films that aren't just end of the year award shit. So that's how we uh, that's how we come to find it on our show today. And I think part of that's emotional. A lot of this is about programming. It's about creating this website. Mm -hmm. And that's something that, you know, you and I mock college all the time. That's what I went to college for. And I remember um, plugging it a lot more year one when it was a, a bigger thing, but awesome start. It's a website I coded kind of while I was in college, not using any of my knowledge from college. I'm still all about the fuck college, but uh, that I happened to be doing while I was in college. And I, man, so for anybody who hasn't coded a gigantic website with a million users, this movie nails it so dead on. It was the perfect, I was so floored by it, actually. It, um, I don't have a lot of nostalgia because as I've mentioned before on the show, I have a terrible fucking memory and... My childhood was pretty much boring and pointless, uh, probably up till I was, I don't know, 16 or 17. But I remember right about those years, I guess, working on Awesome Start. And I had this kind of nostalgia watching the movie, remembering back to that stuff. And it just evoked that perfectly. The film definitely has more drinking and college frat yeah, party, whatever but not the fuck for the is lead going character. on. There. Right, right. That's true. That's true. I spent my time on Mountain Dew coding websites while people were out at frat parties. So it's that kind of attention to detail I really, really like. And I don't even know how, I, it might be things from the book that they pulled. Um, it might just be a really great script. Just these moments that they nail uh, in the movie. I mean, I know even you had to get a little nostalgic seeing Live Journal, right? Yeah. I mean, well, come on. I half nostalgic. I was a dead journal kid. <laughs> sure. Which is far were. more embarrassing. Of course it is too. It is. I'm because, surprised. I wasn't going to say that. I'm I mean, surprised talk about that. exclusivity. Right. I was on dead journal. It's because you're the contrarian. You can't yeah. be on live journal. You, have, right. you might as well have invented dead journal. That's a Michael Kester idea if That's I've ever heard one. Very true. <laughs> but so we get uh, Zuckerberg and he's in his dorm room or whatever. And uh, directly after he talks about, you know, hacking Apache servers he goes to uh, using Mozilla to gather images. Back in the day when Firefox on Windows was the, the giant you know, alternative to Internet Explorer and all the kids in the know on the programming end would be using that. And they're talking about PHP and Perl scripts. I mean, he's thinking the same way a programmer really thinks. I went to mm-hmm. college for programming, so I was surrounded by, you know, it wasn't just the, the one or two kids who did this. I mean, right. everybody did right. programming there. Even, believe it or not, Michael, the women at my college did I don't believe that at all. I would be too busy rating their hotness. But the thing about the fact that he does all this coding is that instead of it being obnoxious and grating and I have no idea what you're doing, I play guitar. Yeah, sure. Um, Tell me about coding from your perspective. Because for me, it's like like a warm fireplace I'm coming back to. What is coding for you? To me, coding looks like too many slashes and debt. To me, I think coding should be like a Mr. Potato Head. Right, right. You have a website and you click and drag how you want your website. That's how it would look for me. And of course, somebody would have to make that. But that's not my problem. W-I-S-I-W-Y-G. I think that's what you see is what you get, we call that. Oh, and okay. it's an interface where you drag and drop things. Hey, look at that. That was officially the most obscure reference on our entire show ever. 
Go ahead. Anyway, the thing that works in the film with the whole W Y W W M D <laughs> is that he's kind of narrating it, but he gets away with it by using his live journal as a drunk blog. Right, right. He drunk blogs his his live journal. Oh, which is so great because that's what you do if right. you have no friends and you're coding. <clears throat> EricIngram.com. Go through the backlog of that. It's literally, I mean, I had one window open. I'm creating awesome start with PHP and fucking Perl scripts. And I use JavaScript. No one cares. Uh, on the right and then on the left was LiveJournal or whatever the blog thing was at the time. Uh, and I'm typing stuff away into that. And, you know, you notice that, too, that great part where he's speaking aloud. He's talking about Apache servers and all that. And that's something that a lot of people who code really do. They have to kind of, I don't, I don't really know why it happens. I don't know the psychology of it. But you'll see that maybe one out of five, maybe even more commonly, if you're in a room of people coding, some people just, even if they're by themselves, they'll be mumbling. I'm the same way. I have to speak aloud as I'm kind of typing it. And it must be so bizarre for someone else to see. It It looks like it does in the movie. You have no fucking clue what they're talking about. They're clearly not trying to communicate a point, but they just have to read out what is essentially a foreign right. language. And they're clearly no longer in Jurassic Park, which is where that's my comfort zone. Oh, right. Is that giant guy. dinosaurs. You just love that that kid shows up in here. That's Are you bizarre. sure it's the Jurassic Park I'm kid? I'm 100% sure that is the Jurassic Park kid. I don't think you're really 100% sure. I think you just want to sound I'm like, like you're 99% sure. or like twice that. I mean, that's the exciting part for me because that's the building stuff. And I like that. But what's exciting for everybody else and moments that I still really enjoy in creating something like that is the the moment of excitement when the creation works. That that moment we get face mash, right? Mm -hmm. When it's up and running or uh, the movie, I mean, it really spotlights those sections. You know, when he finally gets this uh, this website, this empire together and, you know, he turns to Eduardo and he says, oh, it's up. Go on your laptop. Check it out right now. And it's just this moment where, okay, all the hard work is paid off. It's there. And if I could talk about programming for a moment as an art form, mm -hmm. the unveiling is so spectacular because the medium is such that only the programmer really understands getting to it or what it looks like. It's not as if you built a car and people can walk by and see the assembly. You always have the curtain over what you're programming until you hit that button, until you upload it online or you send them the the URL or what have you, and you say, hey, check this out. It's out now. And so he gets face mash up and immediately people can use it. Everything is there in a matter of hours on a fucking Mountain Dew binge. And so people are all gathering around and eventually you get beyond that immediate circle of the people around you have been wondering what the fuck you're working on. But then you go out onto campus and you have you know people around campus. You just walk by and you see them using it. Mm -hmm. That is such a great fucking feeling. Um, it's either that or it's cats who look like Hitler, which right. by the way, was the greatest website of its time. And so I don't know, I can identify with a lot of that. So that almost makes this, I mean, I don't want to sound like it's a parallel story mm -hmm. because obviously basically no one who listens to the show has ever heard of awesome start and everybody's heard of the other website. One is a billion dollar media empire and the other helped pay my rent for a little while. But, uh, all of these moments, I mean, all of the, the kind of beats of the, the character's story uh, I can totally identify with. The character, on the other hand, is kind of an asshole. Yeah. And we'll get to him, but there's there's one other moment along that story that I thought was just really spot on, and that's the moment where you ask, how do you monetize this? Mm -hmm. That becomes an important developmental Well, that's with anything. That that's not even just with sure. a website. Sure. You probably face that with music all the time. All the time. <laughs> well, and it probably goes in the inverse a lot, too, because the industry changes around you quicker than you know here what we're dealing with is he has a cool factor and he doesn't want to lose that there's this um this constant you know tug of war sort of going here this big question looming over them it's cool how much cooler does it need to get until we slap ads on it mm -hmm. i mean slapping ads on is always your first go to you want to slap ads on it that's the fastest way to monetize it's also the fastest way to lose you know the cool right. factor and so they're talking about these things um well, we don't know what it is yet or you know, that conversation they have with Sean Parker, I mean, it's so spot on. It's so perfect. And it's such a great moment for those characters to kind of come to heads and for Mark Zuckerberg to turn into, you know, one of the points in the evolution of him as a character. One of the things that kind of forces him to become, you know, what where he's at at the end of the story. So aside from the fact that my mini fridge was, I literally had a fucking mini fridge yeah. too. 
Uh, my mini fridge was just full of Mountain Dew and uh, not a lot of alcohol, although I did still drink back in the college mm-hmm. days before I became a crazy sober atheist. I also hope I'm nothing like Mark Zuckerberg, but to be honest, all I know about him is what I know from yeah. the social network. And he doesn't seem absolutely terrible in the social no, network. No, he's not the villain of he, the, the he story. He seems kind of like, it's almost like he seems like a general outcast sure. of, of the rest of the world. He's he's functioning, He's it's not that he's functioning on a different level right. or anything like that. He's well, just, he might think he is. Yeah, it's almost like he's just functioning independently mm-hmm. from everything else that's going on. He's doing his own projects. He's got all this other stuff that people are dragging him around to do. Right. But in reality, he wants to just be sitting in front of a computer, making sure everything is going smoothly. Yeah. Sometimes on this show, we talk about, especially during documentary films, about uh, living in a bubble. I think that's probably something we talked about a little in Flock of Dodos, although it was year one of the show. And as I already mentioned, my memory fucking sucks. But, you know, we worry as uh, people with very eccentric ideas, you and mm-hmm. myself, that if we live too much in a bubble, we lose track of what makes everyone else tick. We wonder why the ideas we think are so perfect, everyone else thinks are crazy. We lose our touch with reality a little bit. And, you know, if you look at somebody like Zuckerberg's character, you see that he's not just living in a bubble, he's living in his own personal bubble. I mean, the conversations he has, especially early in the movie, mm-hmm. it, they're not conversations so much as monologues. He's, um, he's talking to himself and other people just happen to be there. He's kind of, he's thinking out loud in the same way that, you know, I mentioned programmers will try and read their code out loud as if it's a language that people could mm-hmm. interpret. He does that even with his business plans, with, um, with seeing the next steps in his story. And it works as a great device for the film because we don't need something like VO. We don't need narration to tell you what he's thinking. Right. Because his mind, I mean, it's always completely open. Right. Uh, there's few instances. I mean, even I guess the instances where he comes up with the idea of relationship status. That's a conversation, which, by the way, only serves that point in the movie. There's mm-hmm. no reason that kid's talking to him other than uh, for the movie to go, oh, and here's where he comes up with relationship status. But he even says it at that point out loud. We see the gears turning. Yeah. We see the light bulb going. Well, we know on, what's going to happen. But he still feels the need to, mm-hmm. to communicate that and to go back and explain that to someone else. Because he wants another person to marvel at his genius. He lives in code and the, the things that he's doing, because he's the only one programming that, especially in the, you know, in the early moments, especially when they're talking about the Harvard project, and he's their only programmer, their only CODIS. Mm-hmm. There's no one else to really share the glory of the hard. They have no idea how hard it is to do these things or what it requires or the, the they can't even really appreciate the, the so-called genius there. Right. I think a really good visual for this is during the uh, the bed fire scene, the scene where, and I love that too, Eduardo's with his insane girlfriend, sort of whatever their status yeah. is weird. You know, he's talking to uh, to Eduardo on the phone, and we've seen these social interactions all the time with him and Eduardo, and we kind of know that he's putting the guy down, and there's maybe a weird jealousy issue yeah. thing here that they they raise. But more importantly, he's barely paying attention to what the guy says. He mm-hmm. might be bouncing ideas off him. But when he's talking to him on the phone, he eventually takes the receiver, you know, he takes the phone away from his ear. He's yeah. just shouting into the receiver. He doesn't yeah. care what's happening on the other end. In fact, they never even talk about, you know, Eduardo's room is being lit on mm-hmm. fire. That's never addressed for the rest of the movie because he's having that one-way conversation. And that's pretty much who he is until he meets Sean Parker. And I think that's a big change for him because... Finally, he has someone he can learn from, someone he can relate to a little bit on maybe not so much the coding side of things, although probably so, but the entrepreneurial side of things. He can relate to him as a businessman and as someone he probably, for the first time, admires. So if we're on the same page here, what I'm ultimately getting at is that they don't paint him as evil. No. He's not a villain. He just happens to be, I think it's two components. I think he's smarter than everyone, and he lacks any humility. Yeah. Those are, uh, I guess, a little hyperbolic, but is that essentially what the what the film's telling us about him, or at least how it portrays him? I think that's, I mean, I don't know if, if I think that's how he's portrayed. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily think the film is trying to tell us anything about him. Sure. Because sure. the only two outside opinions we ever get about him are the first girl who says he's an asshole... And the last girl who says he isn't right. Exactly. So it's immediate. It's left at zero. Yeah. It doesn't waver from any. It, there's no kind of 
inference on how he may be as a human being. Sure, and it's interesting they do those at those points because early on is the you know the least amount of underhanded business asshole stuff he's ever going to do is the first frame of the film where we're being told he's an asshole. And at the end, we've seen all of his, uh, let's call them misadventures. Mm -hmm. And we get to that point, and now we're being told he's not an asshole, which seems to be counter to what a lot of people might be feeling. But yeah, the movie is very subtle. You know, I saw a lot of uh, early Rotten Tomatoes kind of uh, comparisons to things like The Godfather. And it does have that kind of nuance. It's setting up, I mean, even more so than The Godfather and its characters anyways, where it just sets people up and it's just showing you these people. And it would have been so easy for the movie to paint him as an evil person. Mm -hmm. And instead, it just tries to get you inside his head a little bit. It tries to it tries to let the audience understand for themselves more about the character than just telling you who the character is up front. And there are a few scenes where that's marvelously displayed. One, I think, is probably where he's telling off, you know, the lawyer. He's talking about uh, his attention is back at headquarters. And, you know, there they're doing things that. Uh, the lawyer's clients aren't, I think he says, intellectually or creatively capable of. Uh-huh. He basically just puts down the entire room as if he's above being there. He's above that conversation. He makes it clear he doesn't respect those people. Then we look at his interactions with somebody like Sean Parker. So I'm just going to put this out there. And uh, rarely do I do this, but you just saw the movie and I kind of want yep. your take on this. I kind of think Justin Timberlake is fucking amazing in this yeah, movie. Yeah, no, he's incredible. Is that possible? He's, it's absolutely possible. I've never seen him do anything bad, ever. Yeah. Justin Timberlake in his entire career has never done anything that was at least definitely not a misstep. So are we talking about film career here or I'm talking or about music his career? entire celebrity career. Okay. I would let people argue that his Mickey Mouse Club days were <laughs> dubious. Okay. And maybe NSYNC wasn't the best work he's ever done. Sure. But... What you can't argue with is the fact that he has his hand on the pulse of what people yeah, want. You're absolutely it's, right. He's charismatic a hundred percent of the time. And and he's got talent. He's absolutely talented, but more than anything, he's charismatic, which is why he fits the Sean Parker role to a T. Oh, perfect. Because he's not doing anything. He rarely does anything to support or help the project whatsoever. Right. <laughs> Instead he kind of shows up. Waves his hand, everybody knows his name, buys you a drink, and now 7% of the company. Tells them to drop the definite article from the Mm -hmm. name. That's really what they say his biggest contribution is. And you also don't see any of the background of his claims. We don't focus on Napster. We don't say, you know, they do have that great exchange about tearing down the music industry and Tower Records, which I think is fucking brilliant. I love that. But we never see anything to support. We don't know if he goes home to uh, a rotted out empty apartment and he has negative one billion dollars mm-hmm. or if he's actually doing okay he seems to you know pay for dinners and mm-hmm. stuff we don't really know what his true standing is we only know what he means in zuckerberg's life and the the character that he puts himself off as who he wants people to basically believe he is mm-hmm. god that charisma i mean you don't have a better scene to demonstrate that than that lunch, dinner, whatever scene. Buys everybody apple teenies, knows what the drinks... Every, and the thing is, is he knows the names of all of the people right. in the restaurant. Right. That's a really good way to get people to think you're just, you know, you're hot shit. Right. But in the scene before, the scene, the previous scene that we see him in when he wakes up in the apartment and Boop right. turns out I'm Sean Parker, snake in the room, no, that's true grit, uh, turns out that... He says he's broke. Right. So like you said, it's difficult to kind of gauge the standing. You can always flash cash. There's always loans and debt. But, you know, it's weird to kind of think of the Napster guy as being broke. Yeah. Yeah. But we never doubt the charisma. I mean, whether it's that scene, because that's a great introduction to him as a character to find out who he is in the same way that the the girl in the dorm room finds Mm -hmm. out who he is. Awesome scene. But then also when we get to that, you know, Asian fusion restaurant, whatever scene, for the majority of the story he's telling, the uh, the kind of thing we talked about maybe back in Desperado, great storytellers and the charisma there, we don't even hear the story. Mm-hmm. We just see the hand gestures and the waving around right. and everyone else is entranced by the stories he's telling and the, the little anecdotes he's dropping and the parables. And that's all we need to know about him. So if we can just move completely to the side and talk about uh, a visual thing, mm-hmm. a filmmaking thing, sure. that I'm pretty sure has never come up maybe even in a movie before. Yeah, probably not. Kind of a recent phenomenon um, in filmmaking on the internet has been tilt Tilt shift shift. stuff. 
And it shows up in a lot of these interesting proof of concept videos and look what look at this thing that was made with tilt shift. I've never seen it really used in a film before. And we have that in the race scene here. Mm-hmm. And so the race scene is um is with the twins. I don't know enough about sports, nor can I get out of my um entrancement of nostalgia and programming for long enough to pay attention to what it, what is the sport they're rowing. kayaking, something rowing. they row. It's rowing. Don't fucking care about sports. But uh we have this really interesting look here where this this is a good if you've actually seen the social network, if you've fucking watched the movies before you listen to the show, that is tilt shift. That weird look where you're thinking, is that miniatures? What the fuck are they doing there? That is tilt shift. And it's this attempt to make live action look like miniatures using, um, it usually uses wide shots Mm -hmm. and then an artificial depth of field. So where we'll talk about things having a naturally shallow depth of field, like when we press in and we actually see them rowing, we get the um, the close up shots of their faces and they're moving in and out of that depth of field. You know, when they get close to the camera, it's really sharp and then they move back and as they move back, it's, mm-hmm. it's blurry. That's a shallow depth of field. We do that artificially in post in a wide shot because you can't really get a depth of field that shallow in a wide shot. You can get it with miniatures. And so by doing it in post, we make it look as if it's miniatures. To the untrained eye, you might look at that and not really understand why you think you're looking at yep. miniatures, but that's what it is. You have um, you have something that you can't get with the lens, but you do that extreme sort of focal blur on the foreground and background in post. In most of the scenes here, and depending on what your implied point of focus is, it's usually the very bottom of the frame and the very top of the frame that are really blurred out and then a, a stark contrast in the middle. Sometimes in tilt shift stuff, they'll also use a lower frame rate. I don't think they're using it in the scene in the social network, but the lower frame rate, you know, you drop it down from, let's say like a cinematic 24 frames a second, 24 pictures in a second of film. You drop that down to something like 15 or maybe even 10 and you start to get a look of stop motion. Your movie starts to look more like the nightmare before Christmas Mm -hmm. or, um, I don't know, surveillance footage or something like that, where it's a little bit jerkier. And that can add to that tilt shift effect. That can add to the effect of making real life look like miniatures. But there's no way I could talk about that scene without talking about In the Hall of the Mountain King. Right. When was the last time we actually mentioned this on the show before? Did we? Yeah, what was it? I think it was M, right? That had In the Hall of the Mountain King. Oh, yeah, I guess it was. Remember, they whistled it every time he came around. Oh, yeah, that's right. I totally forgot about that. And yeah, that was on the show where we did M. Oddly enough, with another David Fincher movie, we did it with Seven. Oh, that's right. So as far as music goes, there's two people whose names are concerned, but I actually want to mention three. One is Trent Reznor, one is Atticus Ross, and one is Rob Sheridan. Mm -hmm. And so I think we should start with Trent Reznor because that's the most obvious one. And the one you want to talk about most. I don't even know if that's true, actually. I'm I'm really interested in the other two guys as well. So Trent Reznor is Nine Inch Nails. Right. Trent Reznor, uh, he is the song Closer. He is the Closer music video. He has since shaved his head and bulked up, and now he, he was Super Soldier Reznor. He was he Disco is, Reznor for a while. Was disco Reznor. Both in the With Teeth era. And then I guess the Purest Feeling or uh, Pretty Hate Right, machine. right. Man, I'm telling you. I just Strobe Light. <laughs> that was on my birthday, wasn't it? That was strobe April, light? April yeah, Fool's Day. Yeah, Strobe Light was your that. birthday And record. I believe he has a song on there with Justin Timberlake. Uh-huh. That's not a real record, by the way. People are going to go, look. I don't want to send people in the wrong direction because there's, what, 25 Nine Inch Nails albums? Count the Halos. Yeah, they're all organized by Halo numbers. So the first one was a, a Down In It single. And then after that, Pretty Hate Machine, which just got a remaster, and I've been listening to it, and for the first time probably ever, actually liking that album. nice. And has done many, many albums beyond that. Uh, We talked about him. I'm not even going to go through the shows we talked about him on, because it's almost literally every show. Mm -hmm. But I remember things like talking about 300, and the excellent trailer that owed itself to um, The Fragile. Mm -hmm. We didn't mention him on Natural Born Killers, but he organized the soundtrack there. That was his first work ever on a movie, just putting that soundtrack Mm -hmm. together. Although we did talk about that soundtrack quite a bit. And eventually, we're going to find some fucking way to put Lost Highway on the show. And there's a little bit of soundtrack stuff he does there, too. But this was his first time doing a full score. Now, he's been working with Nine Inch Nails. He basically is Nine Inch Nails. Mm -hmm. And he's been doing that stuff for fucking ever since the 80s, I guess. Mm -hmm. Since 89 and Pretty Hate Machine. And they recently took a break for, I mean... People make a big deal out of the break they took, but they take breaks every once in a while. It's one guy. He's allowed. He fucking takes a break every weekend. Yeah, if he needs to go on a lunch or play Metroid and eat some Funyuns or when whatever he has to when do. When you're a solo artist, anytime you're not working on music, you're taking a break. Your band is that's, on hiatus. That's how that works, yeah. right? 
I mean, yeah, so they stopped touring. They played all these farewell shows here, which, by the way, I went to two of the farewell shows, and then they had one literally a block from our studio, and out of spite, I didn't go. I thought, you know what? Fuck. I just went to two of your farewell shows, and now you spring me with another one. So if anybody listening to this went to the Chicago shows, that's right about where we record. We might as well record in the Aragon Ballroom. Better acoustics in there, at the very least. Especially for podcasting. Ding, ding. So Nine Inch Nails is on a supposed hiatus, which they're totally not. Uh, and they go on these you know, six-year breaks where they don't make any music, and then they put out 50,000 million albums. Mm-hmm. A lot of the albums are remix albums, but they're done in such a way that, I mean, you wouldn't even call some of those things remixes. They're yeah. completely new songs. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's an instrumental album with Ghosts. Um, David Fincher was actually kind of petitioning Trent Reznor to do the score for this. And with all the Nine Inch Nails stuff that was going on, I mean, he was just so fucking busy. After this kind of hiatus kicked in, he had some time off. He had the ability to kind of figure out what projects that he'd been meaning to get to for a decade that he finally wants to do. And so what Fincher did, it, it's almost the Sin City kind of method we were talking about. I think this was probably after he finally got Trent to sign in, but he put music from Ghosts into the movie to kind of give Trent a, an idea of what mood he wanted in different places. Mm-hmm. Ghost was this amazing thing that came out. It's, it's four discs. It's an obscene amount of songs. And uh, he did it with Atticus and a couple other people. And they just put together all these songs. They released the first disc for free on the internet. And so there's all this instrumental Nine Inch Nails stuff that came out. And so Fincher just put that in the film. Sends it back to Trent. Says, here's the kind of sound I'm looking for in these different areas. And so this becomes the first full score that Trent Reznor does. All right, so we've been kind of heavy on the Nine Inch Nails. Mm-hmm. So let's get to these other names. I could talk about Trent Reznor literally for another 136 shows, which it turns out I will. Atticus Ross is somebody people know a lot less because he works more behind the scenes. He's the producer and I guess the programmer for a lot of the Nine Inch Nails stuff, but also does a, a lot of other work too. I guess by programmer, they mean the person who programs the arpeggios and the keyboard. Uh-huh, is that, that's got to be it. But he worked on with Teeth. He, wor- he worked on basically the last four albums, With Teeth, Year Zero, which, as I mentioned, is the greatest thing that ever happened. Uh, Ghost, which he actually co-wrote with Reznor, and The Slip. And then he did some other stuff, too, like when Reznor was working back with Saul Williams Mm -hmm. on uh, The Inevitable Rise and Liberation of Nicky Tardust. Awesome album. Oh, that's absolutely a wonderful album. So we worked on it with that. Uh, Tapeworm, which is not actually a real band. Uh, How to Destroy Angels, he's the third member of that with Mm -hmm. Trent Reznor's wife. And then the band Error, which was kind of his side project. He's done some other score stuff as well, uh, different pieces for different movies over the years, but I think he did the entire score for The Book of Eli. Ew. That's probably the only nice thing you could say about The Book of Eli is, that's hey, cr- Atticus Ross, nice score. Probably true. So that's Atticus. And then the third name was Rob Sheridan. Mm-hmm. And Rob Sheridan didn't have a lot to do with the music. He does art direction for Nine Inch Nails, um, art direction for some of the How to Destroy Angel stuff, and he did the cover art for this album. Mm -hmm. And so this is a really exciting thing, this album. Part of what uh, Trent's been doing recently is releasing all his music under this thing called the Null Corporation, which was a label he founded after, you know, getting released finally from his record label. He wanted to do a bunch of crazy stuff with remixes and multi-tracks. You can download some of the Nine Inch Nails songs in, you know, garage band format Mm -hmm. and kind of do the remixes and get all those tracks separated, which is really cool. But they wanted to start releasing a lot of free music and looking at a different business model like he did with Saul Williams when that came out. I think Saul Williams, wasn't that based on a donation model, like donate whatever or not? No, I think it was $5. It was zero or $5. Oh, maybe that was it. I'm, right. Maybe the slip was whatever you want. I'm pretty sure the slip was free. You couldn't donate for the slip. There, I, down, I know that one of them was... There's a deluxe edition. That's what it was. It was uh, free or you pay for the deluxe model. And the deluxe model would be, you know, people who like physical packaging artwork, they would get this huge thing with all these inserts and photos and whatnot. And so a lot of my interest in Nine Inch Nails, especially these days, are the business model stuff. How are they releasing this and trying to counteract the trends in free music? How do you still create some kind of business out of that? And so what they did with this record, and this was one of the first records, I don't buy a lot of new music anyways, because like I keep saying on the show, I don't know anything about Mm -hmm. music, but... This was the first album I bought in a long time. It went up on Amazon and it was three fucking dollars. <laughs> and it's, you know, 20 songs or something. I mean, it's a big record. And every single thing that's in the movie, including In the Hall of the Mountain King, which, by the way, industrial version of In the Hall of the Mountain King, awesome. 
Uh, but it's three dollars, two ninety nine, and you got the whole digital thing, and it fucking rocked. So Rob Sheridan did the artwork for it, and the cover is actually my least favorite of any of the artwork he did for it. Uh, if you want to see the rest of it, it's I believe it's in the physical packaging. I have the digital. I don't really know, but it's on Rob Sheridan dot com forward slash T S N. And if you can't find it on there, I'll just put it up on the page for this episode. But it's all of these. Um, I was showing you this stuff earlier. It's uh, glitchy images, mm-hmm. images that look a little distorted, I guess disrupted might be a, a better way to look at that. And he did this using kind of an organic method as much as we think about, you know, using machines and industrial and what have you. So rather than going into Photoshop and piling on all these different layers to make things look really messed up, he didn't cut it apart there and move it around. Instead, he took press stills and uh, he describes this a little bit on his website he took these press stills given to him by the, the company that did the movie, and he opened them in Photoshop, I don't know, saved his PSD or whatever. And then he would go in, he would open the images with text edit, mm-hmm. where the image basically comes up as a bunch of fucking code, gibberish. And he would paste and copy and cut things out of the text. Uh, I think he mentions on the site that he actually had fun going through and finding fan fiction on the internet to copy full paragraphs out and then paste in there. And then he would save that and open it in Quick Look, which is this thing on the Mac where you hit the space bar and a preview comes up. And so he noticed that the way it rendered those images in Quick Look would be uh, really aesthetically pleasing. It would give you these odd kind of repeating patterns and different things. It's hard to talk about this without actually looking mm-hmm. at the images. But when you see that and know that was created, rather than the usual go into Photoshop and make it look pretty, just by trial and error, just by experimentation through mm-hmm. that, I think that's really, really cool. So if we could bring it back in on the social network, uh-huh. I know, thanks for giving me lots of time to talk <laughs> about the Nine Inch Nails and music. I guess the biggest thing I like about the movie is everything it wasn't. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, we just spent all this time talking about what it was, and that's great, and that makes the movie, you know, that makes the movie pretty fucking good, but the movie could have so easily been all of these awful things. Mm-hmm. I mean, that was the whole point of the award show kind of conversation. Right. You know, the movie doesn't talk about privacy at all. Right, which is what's hot. Yeah, that's a huge concern of the site right now, what people are talking about. But you don't even get that, not even in undertones. It could totally get away with subtly mentioning privacy, but the movie's concerned with, you know, withstanding the test of time. Mm -hmm. And so you don't get any conversation about that. That's not what the movie's about. The movie is about Zuckerberg and these people in betrayal. And then in the ending, too, it tells you all these people won. They won the fucking lawsuits. And so, you know, the movie could have treated that. This could have been Wall Street, right? The Oliver Stone movie. You could have had a clear villain and it's a story about one man trying to overcome and beat him out and what have you. The movie's not about that. It's not about how Zuckerberg is this evil empire and everybody has to, you know, it only really followed his story. It's almost sympathetic of Mm -hmm. him. I say almost because most movies would treat him like he's Hitler. Right. And so this movie treats him pretty neutrally just telling the story. And so the other people, the brothers, the twins, um, also awesome job, commendable CGI, two people, one actor, cool, didn't even talk about that, but uh, doesn't treat any of those people like champions. It's not cookie cutter. It's not they're overcoming. It's just the guy's story. And I thought that was really cool. We should talk about the Hudsucker Proxy while we still have time left in this show. Oh, great. So the Hudsucker Proxy, aside from being the film with the worst name what in is the history. name? Well, God damn this fucking name. The film, the film's title has some oddly sexual tones. Nobody has any idea what a proxy is. Hudsucker's a made-up word. Terrible title for a film. Sure. Only a credit that the Coen brothers would have come up with. Right. And so this is the Coen brothers joint with Tim Robbins. If all of this hasn't made you excited <laughs> for the film, just wait till we get to talking about it. I think it's funny because the furthest anyone gets in the title is they might know what proxy means. Uh huh. They have a general idea of what proxy means, and they kind of they kind of go, "Okay, well, I got proxy." They put that in there, and then they look at the rest of the title and go, "Fuck it, I and give up." It doesn't it. flow whatsoever. The Hudsucker proxy. Oh, beautiful. I think it's just part of the ongoing Coen Brothers joke about the film. Uh-huh. The film in itself is almost more performance art than art. I think that's absolutely true. The fact that they made the movie is sort of the joke. It's, it's sort of the laugh to it them. It seems like the whole film is a collection of them going, what can we get away with? Right, right. You're raising an eyebrow as you say that. I think it's perfect. So rather than our previously, uh, you know, we talk about the social network. It's a serious look at something that's silly. It's meaningless. Uh, Hudsucker is instead kind of a farcical look at serious business. Mm-hmm. 
You know, we're not talking about, um, I mean, I guess how goofy it looks at things, uh, how it feels about things and treats them is exactly equivalent to how meaningless the subject matter of the social network is. There we had a movie that was very heavy about something fucking trivial that was affecting these people's lives. In contrast here, we're talking about, uh, I mean, the stock market. And that doesn't, you know, necessarily, especially if you don't have any stock, Mm -hmm. what do you care about the stock market? Not very serious. It's a bunch of numbers and funny people shouting and waving stuff around on Wall Street. That was not a Wall Street reference. I already made one of those. I'm talking about actual Wall Street. But this can make or break lives. It could really destroy people. We see that in the movie. Yeah. Everybody's trying to fucking commit suicide. I mean, that's some pretty serious business. But instead, we have a screwball comedy. Yep. I think this is probably my favorite era of business. Yeah, the I'm 1994s? Not, the, the 1958s. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, all right. So it's the year after Atlas Shrugged came out. And maybe it's just Atlas Shrugged stuff. Maybe I just look at it and go, oh... Atlas Shrugged, I read that book, and it was nice, and I'm not actually thinking about the 58 era of business. But it goes so well hand-in-hand with the Art Deco stuff. Now, I'm going to have a huge problem here. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about Art Deco on the show. Mm -hmm. It's a very visual art form. Turns out art is difficult to describe in words. This is a very audio show. What do we do about that? Watch Batman. <laughs> Look at the Metropolis poster. That might be. Yeah, there's another good example. You're really hitting it. See, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. It's possible everyone just knows what Art Deco is and we don't have it's to It's dark describe and it. arches and gold and gothic. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of it. I don't I don't know if I would describe it as gothic, although I guess that word gets thrown around so much and we've already hit all these Tim Burton references. So maybe it is. But it's kind of this thing that was created after World War One. And it was pretty dominant until, I guess I would say, the 40s, maybe the early 40s. It's very, um, I guess it's geometric. It has influences in uh, previously in modernism and in futurism. It's kind of, you know, it's the slogan in the movie, the Hudsucker slogan. The fe- I think it's the future is now. I believe it is the future, it right could, under the giant clock. Right, the, the giant fucking clock. The giant time-shifting clock. Mm-hmm. Clocks always shift time. time. I can't say that either. Nope, it I definitely keep doesn't. Stopping Keep time, time stopping clock. That's fine. Save the clock tower. The fourth dimensional paradigm shifting clock. Is that? Yeah, that sounds about right. I would have also accepted Magic Negro House. Every time we talk about the Magic Negro on the show, I think we haven't talked about the Magic Negro before. Although I think we did on Oh Brother Where Art Thou, our last Coen Brothers movie, um, when we talked about the guy on the. Hand I can't cart. spoil the. Would that be a spoiler? There's a guy on a handcart. Okay, I guess not. Well, you know he's going to do something magical now. We've ruined the film for people. Turns into a fairy and then into Bruce Willis the whole time. But Art Deco was an interesting movement of art to look back at the era it came from because it affected everything in the era. I mean, it was beyond, let's say, paintings and, uh, and what you traditionally think of as what we would hang in a museum art. It also affected fashion. Mm-hmm. It affected architecture in a huge oh, yeah. way. It affected even just look at the automobiles of the era. It might be most accurate to describe Art Deco as looking like that era or... It's um, pretty close. You know, as, as looking at the 20s to the 40s, somewhere in there. And so I mentioned those go hand in hand, but part of why I like business in 58 is because it always seems to have this focus on Art Deco. Art Deco was dead by that time, but mm-hmm. if we're talking about industry in 58, that seems to be a style. It had a resurgence in the 60s. So when you look at stuff like the cover of the Ayn Rand novels, right, Atlas Shrugged, or you look at the cover of the Fountainhead, or um, even a lot of the other covers of her stuff have been retrofitted to that. And then you look at a lot of this movie's art direction. The 60s is celebrating the Art Deco stuff that happened earlier in the 30s. Right. And I think these particular works I'm talking about did that because Art Deco focuses on industry. It focuses on, you know, because it had that huge influence in architecture Mm -hmm. or in transportation. You know, if Atlas Shrugged is about railroads, then there's a piece of transportation. But the thing about this film is that although it it seems a lot of the actors seem to think it's a period piece, Mm -hmm. um, it's made in 1994. Right. The film came out in 1994. And if it's a testament to any time period, it's 1994 and not 1958. Isn't that funny? The film thinks it's a time capsule of 1958, but it's not. It is a time capsule of 1994. Why do you think that is? What is it about this film that screams, this is a movie from 94 made about 58? Well, the thing, I think the big things about films in the 90s are people got away with a lot more shit. 
Supernatural stuff was a lot more allowed. Special it was more effect- lenient. No one yeah. questioned it. Right. Special effects were allowed to suck. Yeah. For that's... some, I don't know how it happened, but somewhere between Star Wars and the year 2000, people just thought special effects, you know, whatever, as long as they are special effects, they're right. going to look good. This film has the, the 90s bad special falling effects. It has <laughs> Bruce Campbell in a lead role. It has uh, Jennifer Jason. I mean, even the cast, right? Jennifer yeah. Jason Lee, Tim Robbins. All these actors just kind of pop up. They're 1994 actors. Paul Newman didn't, yeah. wasn't acting much more after 94. No, certainly, certainly not. Certainly not in a role like this. Yeah. The film screams 94. It's also it's also during the Coen Brothers obscurity era. Yeah. And, I mean, all of it, it's more 1994 than it will ever be 1958. It's funny to think about that. You've hit on a, a couple interesting bits about the movie. Um, first of all, the other actors considered were, I think, Tom Cruise and Winona Ryder. Yeah. Which is funny because they went on to have bigger careers than a lot of these actors, but they also still scream mid nineties. Yeah, they totally Um, do. You know, while we've already tagged Burton once, come on, Winona Ryder. But this was a movie that I believe was actually written in the eighties and the Coen brothers, this was looked at to be at least a hopeful for a mainstream film. They decided let's stop doing these obscure art films we're going to do a mainstream film. And while the film wasn't a huge commercial success, if we look at their movies now, they're a lot more well-known mm-hmm. than the Hudsucker Proxy seems um, Seems like a backshelf gem film that needs to be dusted off by comparison of the, the recent stuff. Sure. Their career just expanded so exponentially after that. But it's not just the Coen brothers. Uh, you mentioned Bruce Campbell. Yeah, and I guess we can't consider this a Bruce Campbell there's movie no because there's no makeup, right? We'll just pretend he didn't even appear in this. And of course, we hit Bill Cobbs, who has a voiceover, a very '90s voiceover, uh, early in the movie. But we we saw him actually in The Brother from Another Planet yeah. earlier on this show. But the point I was getting at with Bruce Campbell is that you know that also ties it, of course, to Sam Raimi because mm-hmm. where there's smoke, there's the, fucking fire. It's really the only like remain. It's not the only remaining tie to Sam <laughs> Raimi, but it's the only human remaining tie, aside from the fact that the film looks like and sounds almost exactly like Darkman, which is a <laughs> Sam Raimi film yeah, that nobody's seen. It certainly is. It's the Hudsucker proxy of Sam Raimi's career, although the Hudsucker proxy is actually the Hudsucker proxy of Sam Raimi's career. Fascinating. So what I'm trying to get at is that he wrote this film, and he actually did some second unit directing and stuff on it as well. So this was a movie, I believe, that was written in the 80s, originally in the mid-80s, by Joel and Ethan Coen, the Coen brothers, and Sam Raimi. I had no idea that these guys had any history together until I found the Hudsucker proxy. Mm -hmm. It was so bizarre. It's like when you find out that George Clooney was a producer on A Scanner Darkly. You know, you don't even right. know that these things are tied together right. at all. But I guess it goes back before that because um, I'm pretty sure it was Joel Cohen who worked with Sam Raimi on The Evil Dead, the original Evil Dead movie. So these guys have known each other for quite some time. And it's just now that one of their pictures that they've been working on since the 80s got made by a studio. A studio decided, okay... We know who the Coen brothers are now. It's the right time to make this movie. It's weird, though. I don't know if you see any of the usual Sam Raimi elements to this, uh, to the film at all. And I don't know if that's because of the directing stuff. Oh, I would say that the Sam Raimi stuff exists in the scenes where his feet are in a burning trash can. Okay, no, you're right. You're right. (laughs) Yeah, there are a couple of the... I guess the moments are just so over-the-top insane. I'm just describing Sam Raimi movies now, I suppose. Um, I didn't even notice that at all. But now as I mentally recatalog the film, there are a lot of key moments that kind of feel like that. There are Evil Dead 2 hand type scenes or um, Spider-Man 2 Doc Ock hand type scenes. I guess it's just people's appendages that are acting up. Right. Thank you, Sam Raimi. Do you have a drag me to hell moment we can reference? Uh, It's not a it's not an appendage battle, but there is a goat battle. Oh, well, that's good enough. Yeah, okay, so if I would have just listened to our fucking show on Drag Me to Hell, I would remember all these moments. So I'd like to, if I may, describe my favorite Coen Brothers scene of all time. Please do. While this certainly isn't my favorite Coen Brothers movie of all time, it's definitely got my favorite Coen Brothers scene in it. We're sitting in a Hudsucker board meeting with Hudsucker himself, right, at the head of the table. And he's just sitting there. It's a mundane meeting. They're talking about quarterly profits. And it's slowly zooming in and out of this window. It shows his face. He's bored. We zoom into the window. We pull back from the window. We look back at his face. 
he might as well be checking his watch, which he eventually does pull his watch out and set it oddly. We're wondering what the fuck is this guy doing? And so he clears his throat and he stands on his chair. He winds up and he runs down the table like it's some kind of diving board and leaps out of the window, which is pretty monumental. And this would already make it one of my favorite Coen Brothers scenes because it's out of nowhere and it's just completely embodies so many wonderful things about the Coen Brothers and that that dark sense of humor. The fact that this is funny, although nothing funny is happening, a man is just killing himself, right. it's hilarious. But after that, we proceed to debate business and stock after this man just jumped out the window. We don't take any time to consider that. One character does. One character cries about it. But everybody else is talking about how this will affect the company. We never really knew much about that guy. He was always mysterious. Everybody's trying to say something prolific to be quoted on. And uh, they just go back to business as usual. And so they pitch the movie there. They give you the entire pitch of the movie. And it's so blatant. But the absurdity of what just happened lets how blatant it is slip by you. You don't care because you're still thinking, hold on, aren't we going to address the fact that guy jumped out the window? Can we stop for a second and talk about that? You're getting a mezzanine joke that shows up. A mezzanine joke, by the way, which probably wouldn't have worked if you were paying more attention. Yeah. But because the guy just jumped off the window, uh, I think it's stock price when they invoke mezzanine for the third time. Yes. And it's really funny. I love it. You move from that to the double stitch. I mean, it's just getting so absurd. And this is only 10 minutes into the movie, and the absurdity is about peaked. They have a running gag of uh, the circle, which mm-hmm. is for kids. And I don't know, did you, um, was the circle spoiled for you? Because I know you've seen stills from the movie, and the fucking hula hoop is on the poster, right? Oh, So I, did you know hula hoop before, or did you kind of just make I a had, good guess? I didn't know anything about this film. So you just made a guess, it was the hula hoop. I made a, I looked at it, and I was like, this is the kind of film that's going to joke <laughs> that this is a hula hoop. Right. My, my guesses were hula hoop, bouncy ball, or donut, but I knew that two of those had already been invented. See, I just figured the guy's an idiot, he's talking about the circle. What the fuck? And when they get to the moment with the hula hoop, that was such a great moment for me. Even though the synopsis and poster tried to ruin it, I hadn't seen either of those things until after I saw the movie. So I hope people go in not knowing about the hula hoop, but now we've just ruined it for everyone. Spoilers. So a lot of the themes from this movie, I felt like were kind of covered in talking about the social network and more the, uh, not necessarily in talking about the CEO and who he was, but what kind of person a CEO is. It, the whole point of the farce is to look at, you know, the hierarchy over the corporate world and, and mock that. But that's a hierarchy that was so explored in the social network, I don't feel like we need to cover well, it. Well, that's why we jumped straight to the 44th floor in Hudsucker Proxy, is we didn't have to worry about the trip up. So we'd be doing the movie a real disservice to talk about the very thing it's mocking. Right. But we once made a call for, uh, I think it's when we talked about Bucket of Blood during the Music Box Massacre 5 show. And uh, we said we didn't get enough movies with beatniks. Uh Beatniks required some more mocking. So as we move into the end of the film, we have Steve Buscemi playing a random beatnik at a bar for some strange reason. That's fine. I'm totally okay with that. But that's not the part of the movie that bothers me. Oh, you're part- bothered by something I'm in the movie. All, well, Can I on. guess it's the clock that stops time? It is. It's We have a very Cohen Christmas at the end of the film here. Oh, God. Where it's I'm getting Oh Brother, Where Art Thou flashbacks. Big business and haha, right. man in an angel suit, hula hoop for a hat, whatever the fuck, I don't care. <laughs> I think those are called halos. We covered no, that, that in the Nine Inch Nails, Nails discussion. Oh. oh, God. We get a boxing match between these two brief cameo characters there's an angel with a ukulele. It's the guy who looks like he's out of a prison movie or Oz on HBO yeah, or something. Right. Who chisels things off the door. Uh-huh. And Because you always need the guy chiseling things off the door in these movies. Right. You know, we just mentioned right. Seven. I think there's a, a good one of those scenes in there, too. So we have that guy and we have Bill Cobb's character. And they decide to duke it out in the clock tower. Dentures in the gears and Tim right. Robbins survives. It's a wonderful life. You would definitely consider this part of the Coen Brothers signature at this point. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've covered two of these in a row now with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I'm curious to see next time I uh, slide a Coen Brothers movie, sneak it into our schedule here, Mm -hmm. if we see the exact same thing happened at the end. We have a website, doublefeatureshow.com. You can get those uh, Rob Sheridan things on there. Go take a look at that because it's awesome. Um, we have an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a MySpace page. We have an iTunes that you can leave us a review thing on. And donations, uh, yes. donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Two of the people who donate, we're going to let them pick the end of the year spectacular show. 
Um, they'll get to each pick out a movie and we'll pair those up. So get your lists of potential movies together and, uh, I don't know, what do we say? Lists of three or more? Does that sound good? Yeah, lists of three or more. Give us at least three options, preferably five or yeah. ten options. Right. And we'll do our best to make the greatest possible double feature, or perhaps the worst possible double feature, depending on how fucking awful your selections are. That's usually how we roll. I love this game because neither of the people, unless they've coordinated this and they both happen to be picked, will have any idea what the other person wants to put uh-huh. in for the double feature. It's going to be such a disaster. Subscribers will also get a thing in the intro, but you know about that. So what movies are we doing on the show next time? Next time we're going to do Equilibrium and Doomsday and some ass-kicking, futuristic, mumbo-jumbo shit episode. Oh, this is perfect. This is a movies that take from other things, but do a really good job of it. Yeah, Double right. feature. And I have a feeling we'll have some kind of weird conversation about, maybe not Art Deco, but another architectural art style when we talk about Equilibrium. Cannibalism. Watch more fucking film. Bye. And so the other people, the brothers, the twins, um, also awesome job, commendable CGI, two people, one actor, cool, didn't even talk about that, but uh, doesn't treat any of those people like champions. It's not cookie cutter. It's not they're overcoming. It's just the guy's story. And I thought that was really cool. We should talk about the Hudsucker proxy while we still have time left in this show. Oh, great. Is that actually just one actor? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it's one dude. That's bizarre. Yeah. Um, Fincher said, actually, that he wanted to get around some of the CG stuff that he uses, especially after fucking Benjamin Button, right? And so the only really CG thing that he did in this movie was, the you know, yeah, use a, a stand-in, and that guy had to just do both of the performances. That's awesome. Pretty fucking cool, right? I guess we will cover it. <laughs>